And now you told us how we can protect ourselves eventually from getting Alzheimer's disease. But what causes it on first place? Yeah. So what causes it is, 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 is of course, still um, a question of research. But there are two things which are clear. Um, so we have in Alzheimer's disease uh, the so-called familial cases and we have the sporadic cases. And familiar in this case means that there is a mutation in a particular gene and this is the reason why uh, people get Alzheimer's disease. And the very first patient that Alois Alzheimer was describing, uh, this was a woman called Auguste Deta who had Alzheimer's already with 51 years of age, which is super unusual normally. Most people get it in their 80s, and if we would all live up to 120, most likely we all have Alzheimer's disease. Um, what we know now is that Augusta Deta, who lived very close to here, so she was from Kassel and then mm -hmm. was um, studied by Alzheimer, of course, in Munich. Um, so she had a mutation in a particular gene called prisonellin. And the prisonellin is part of a complex that cleaves a protein that we call amyloid precursor protein. And this is another gene that, when it's mutated, we know, can cause this familiar form of Alzheimer's disease, which is characterized by very early onset. So people get it in their 40s sometimes. And um, Alzheimer looked into the brain of Augusta Deta after she died, and he already found two things 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago now, that we still study today. And these were protein aggregates. And one of the protein aggregates that he discovered are the so-called amyloid plaques, what we know now is that these are aggregates outside of the cell and they consist mainly of short fragments of this APP, the amyloid precursor protein, that is cleaved again by proteins which include this prisonellin. So then there is, this is one hallmark, so Alzheimer's disease, disease patients have a brain full of plaques. And the strategy to treat them was to remove these plaques. There's one other hallmark that Alzheimer also already described in the brain of Augusta Deta. And these are protein aggregates that are now not outside of the cell, but inside the cell. And these are aggregates that mainly consist of a protein called tau. So tau is a protein that is linked to transport. It controls microtubuli. It's also found at the synapse doesn't seem to have a function that is so too well ascribed. If you knock it out in a mouse, there's not much of a phenotype, for example, so it could also be compensated. But this is the hallmark of, of, of Alzheimer's disease and many other neurodegenerative diseases that collectively we cause also uh, agriopathy, so some proteins kind of aggregate. And the idea is that, of course, if a protein aggregates inside the cell, in the end, every process will be disrupted, right? Because there are many things which are deregulated. It binds other proteins, it binds RNAs. And uh, if it's outside the cell, of course, what you see in the vicinity of these plaques is that dendrites just die and spines and synaptic connections um, get lost. So this is what you see. This is, this is a familiar case. And most of the model systems at the cellular level or the animal models are really based on these two models. So there are hundreds of animals, actually, models that have been generated which overexpress in various combinations mm -hmm mutant forms of this amyloid precursor protein, or tau. Now, interestingly, tau is not mutated in Alzheimer's disease patients. It's mutated in another disease that we call frontal temporal lobe dementia, um, which also is close to Alzheimer's, the second most often or the most often neurodegenerative diseases affecting people under 65 years of age, whereas Alzheimer's disease is then more for the older population. Now, the therapeutic strategies so far have really focused to remove the plaques and remove the tau. And for a very long time, this was not very successful. And there are many reasons for this. The first one is actually that, well, we do have these familiar cases, but we know also nowadays that one pill does not fit all. So um, it's a multifactorial disease with tons of disease factors. There's also not something like pure Alzheimer's disease. So specifically in older people, there's a comorbidity. So people always have a little bit of Parkinson, a little bit of that actually. Some people uh, develop dementia, which is the clinical outcome of Alzheimer's because they have uh, heart problems and things like this. So probably there are very few people, which we call the sporadic ones, the, the, the older ones that really have this pure amyloid pathology. Then also there are uh, there's, there's quite some data suggesting that um, 
there are people who have a brain full of these pathologies, but they had no Alzheimer's disease clinically, so they are cognitively totally intact. Now, how do we bring all this together nowadays? And there the point is that um, the clinical trials that we did for the last 20 years, they all failed. None was a success. In some of the cases, actually, even patients got worse when these kind of processes uh, were manipulated. Um, and there are two things to this. First of all, people were treated, treated much too late. So in the early trials, I mean, sometimes there was no effect because the diagnosis was made, well, this is Alzheimer's by a, sometimes even primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. So God knows what these people really had. Very heterogeneous group of people that you treated. And then, of course, statistically, you don't see a difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is actually that, that it has been ignored, that um, a lot of people actually have also other reasons in addition to amyloid that you would need to treat. So just get rid of the plugs uh, doesn't make sense. Also, there was this theory that all these aggregates are actually something beneficial. So that, you know, these little peptides are toxic and there is a compensatory mechanism that puts us into these aggregates to put them away, you know. And then if you release them, then actually it would get even worse. Nowadays, I think what we really clearly know is that we just treated the wrong patient population. Mm -hmm. Because, as I said... We know now very um, precisely that the pathology starts already 20 or 30 years before you see any clinical symptom. And, and, and that is important because the patient itself will also never realize this. So there's a one very good criteria, there's even a scientific publication about this, that you don't have Alzheimer's disease if you come to the memory clinic and say you have Alzheimer's disease. Because normally it's the relatives that have mm -hmm. to force the patient to go and uh, get testing and things like this. Um, but this is the point. And now there have been actually three trials that were kind of successful with the antibodies. So aducanumab was the first, licanumab and donizumab is now there. And um, why are they now showing first signs of the fact that actually you can have a beneficial effect with an anti-amyloid therapy? Well, because the companies that run these trials now put a lot of effort and money into patient stratification. So now in these trials, which show first signs of being successful, actually, you treated people who really are very, very early, and they are confirmed by um, imaging approaches, by functional imaging. For example, you can look with a uh, MRI scanner and see, do these people really have plaques and amyloid building up? And only these people who clearly have this and are very, very early in the pathology are now included and get this therapy. And then all of a sudden you see, yes, first of all, something that we always saw, the plaques are gone. So this always worked. So in a way, in the patients, you always saw what the animal model was showing you. So the animal models are all really good. But there was no improvement in cognitive function. And now, I mean, it's also not super dramatic and significant. It's debatable what it means if you increase by a few points on a scale. Mm -hmm. um, because in the end, the question is, can the patient lead a life rather independently or not? and not if it increases three points on a cognitive score. But and there are good signs, actually, that these things work, and, and that is because you not only remove this amyloid, but you do it really, really early. And that's what you need for a causative therapy. So if 50% of the cells are already dead, you can remove as much amyloid as you want. You mm -hmm. will never see an effect. So the amyloid is gone, but there's no improvement mm -hmm. in cognition. Mm -hmm. So this is why, in addition to the therapies that most likely do work as they should, as we know now, and they're already approved. Um, we need to have ways to identify these people really, really early. Now, the question is, how do you do this, right? And, um, of course, you cannot do in practice then what they did um, in the clinical trials so that you spend millions of euros to screen everybody above 50 with an MRI, um, PET scan, and, and CSF taken and all this stuff uh, every other year. So this is why the field is now really moving to have um, markers that you can use at the population level for screening. And then you need liquid biopsies, but you don't want to have your cerebral spinal fluid. Actually, you want to have blood. And there is a lot of effort and also very promising data that at least what looks now, so when in your brain amyloid is building up, in the cerebral spinal fluid and in the blood, it goes down because it builds up in the brain. And this now you can uh, very reliably measure in the blood, this drop of amyloid, for example. And that correlates well, has been shown with the MRI. 
-hmm. So the idea is actually that you don't have to put everybody into a brain scanner, but you can first do a blood test, which would be, of course, much cheaper, much easier and super fast to be done. And um, also that doesn't need much of an infrastructure, right? So this is one thing that, that people go about. And then there's great hope that actually when this will be available and you start with the therapies really early, that this would be super beneficial. Now, what is now on the market are these three different antibodies against amyloid, which seem to work very well. The question is, is this now something that you want to give on the long run because it's also super complicated and it comes with some really severe side effects. So if you give these drugs, probably every two months people have to monitor it by MRI so that they don't get any micro hemorrhages or bleeding in their brain. So that's also not so easy. Um, but there are ideas now that maybe you don't have to do this all the time. It's rather the strategy. If you, if you identify people early, you give them, for example, an amyloid treatment with an antibody, but you give it just as long as the amyloid is cleared from the brain. And then you stop and then you give some other drugs, some maintenance therapies that, you know, keep the status for a while. And then maybe in five years, you have to do it again, something like this. And in addition, of course, you still need other therapeutic approaches that help to just increase the learning ability and plasticity. And this is something where we are working on now, in addition to finding biomarkers, um, to give, for example, epigenetic drugs, which are known to be um, key regulators of cognitive function. And if you inhibit certain molecules there at the epigenetic level, you can clearly see that there's a cognitive enhancement effect. Mm -hmm. So something like, mm -hmm. you know, a pill that would uh, mimic the exercise effect that we just talked about, for mm -hmm. example. So this is where the field is now going. And there are a million of other um, uh, approaches. People also try to knock down tau with mm -hmm. so-called antisense oligos and mm -hmm. things like this. There are other therapies, anti-inflammatory therapies. I mean, everything that worked in animal models, but never worked in humans for the very same reason that I just talked about with the amyloid, at the time point when the patient nowadays is diagnosed, it's too late. Because also epidemiologically, there's a clear um, uh, correlation, people taking anti-inflammatory drugs for whatever reason, rheumatoid arthritis or something like this, they have a lower risk to get Alzheimer's disease or cholesterol, actually, uh, drugs that decrease cholesterol, for example. They also work, but of course not as a drug when you give them when the patient is already sick. So the, the, the future is actually markers for early detection and then combinational therapies. So probably we also go away from the fact that there's just one drug mm. that has to be given. Mm. Most likely it's be a combination, maybe not all at the same time, but at different time points that will be combined. And for the early detection, I think there is this idea that there would be something like a dementia compass or something like this, where you have a set of 10 different tests blood-based biomarkers, maybe some digital health apps, for example, where you can test your cognition uh, that people just randomly are offered to do once they are 50. And they can then um, screen their cognitive reserve, so to say. And then, you know, when, when three of these 10 tests actually get down, then you get a message, okay, go to the memory clinic and have you checked up. And then they can decide if you have to get a brain scan or a more sophisticated blood test of amyloid so that you have these people early. Like they do in, in, in you know, cancer screening programs, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. which have been very successful. Neuroscience and beyond. No more. Get inspired.